This is the Dreadful Podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we're here talking about Lovecraft Country, Season 1, Episode 1, Sundown. Stories are like people. Love them doesn't make them perfect. You just try and cherish them, overlook their flaws. Yeah, but the flaws are still there. Yeah, they are. But I love Pope stories. (laughs) I love that the heroes get to go on adventures in other worlds. To fight and surround with us, defeat the monster, save the day. <laughs> Little Negro boys from the south side of Chicago don't notoriously get to do that. Unless they join the army. Didn't join for adventure. Welcome back, fellow Dreadfuls. This is the Dreadful Podcast from TV Podcast Industries, and we're here uh, discussing Lovecraft Country, Season 1, Episode 1, Sundown. I am one of your Dreadful hosts, John. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. And yeah, we've decided to turn the Dreadful Podcast into our horror podcast. We watched the first episode of Lovecraft Country and couldn't not podcast about this show. Absolutely not. It was... um, I don't know if you got the same vibes as us, but this was a really lovely episode um, with so many different layers. And dare I say it, that you could see the love in the craft of this uh, this episode. So we're really excited to talk about Lovecraft Country. It really did feel like something special, didn't it? Something brand new that we haven't seen in quite a long time. You know, horror TV shows, you know, there's lots of them with things like Walking Dead and that kind of stuff out there. But this felt really special in the lead up to it. You know, it was all being advertised around J.J. Abrams' involvement and Jordan Peele's involvement. You know, we've loved Jordan Peele's movies uh, that he's done, the horror movies that he's done over the last oh, couple definitely. of years. Definitely. Us, um, Get Out, mm-hmm. uh, really like phenomenal yeah. stuff uh, for sure peaks the interest when you hear the involvement of them but uh, they are just on as producers on the show so still had that little trepidation about what's going to be presented but once we saw this episode we just had to had to get out the microphones yeah and record, right? get in the podcast booth mm-hmm. and podcast away to our fellow listeners yeah. uh, for sure and and again a really sort of literary uh, kind of uh episode at least Mm -hmm. and maybe the season i'm just thinking back to our previous stuff that we've done with uh penny dreadful seasons one through to three you know all based on literary characters Mm -hmm. which just kind of added this richness uh of thought and uh, and i suppose meaning behind certain things and i think here i i love the um the description of uh courtney b vance's character george freeman um who's atticus's uncle who's warm funny and well read uh you know mm-hmm. he certainly brings that literary element to it along with atticus as well yeah. uh, and it, it just adds new layers of meaning to to those books uh, the people behind them as much as um to the story and, and what the story's trying to say so yeah really really interesting stuff so we're here to give our spoiler filled discussion of episode 1 of Lovecraft Country um and of course if you're new to TV Podcast Industries and if you're new to Dreadful Podcast, uh, you can pop on over to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com. You can subscribe there on any good or evil podcast catcher of your choice. Mm-hmm. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on Google Podcasts. You name it. Pick a podcast. Search TV Podcast Industries or the Dreadful Podcast and you'll be able to find us there. And please subscribe uh, leave a review if you want to, or rate us. Uh, sharing the love is, of course, sharing uh, the podcast. Absolutely. And we'd also love to hear from you as the season goes on. Email us to feedback at TV Podcast Industries with any thoughts you have on these episodes of this first season of Lovecraft Country. Yeah, I think with that, we should uh, boldly go into Lovecraft Country mm-hmm. with torches, guns, and a fair amount of fear with us and Absolutely. trepidation for sure. Um, so yeah, Derek, what are some of the details for episode one? 
Well, the show's based on the novel Lovecraft Country by Matt Ruff. Uh, this episode was directed by Jan Demang. Uh, we will recognize this guy. He's a French director who directed the horror comedy Dead Set from uh, Charlie Brooker. John, one of our absolute Great favorite stuff. go-to horror comedies. It's kind of up there for me. I know it's a TV show and a lower budget, but up there for me with Shaun of the Dead. Definitely, as a, as a good definitely. concept translated very well. Into, yeah, really into good. Comedy. If you've seen Big Brother and if you've seen zombie movies and you combine the two, mm-hmm. then you get Dead Set. Absolutely. Uh, Really good. From Charlie Brooker, also uh, well-known for uh, Black Mirror. Mm-hmm. But certainly, uh, it's an interesting take on the reality TV show, certainly. for sure. Certainly. Uh, and actually, they have one of my favorite takedowns of a zombie ever mm-hmm. in that, which is using a duvet to cover them uh, so that they don't bite you and stabbing them or at least killing them off in some way. I can't remember how now. Uh, through the duvet cover. Yes, so, yes, cool. uh, a great idea. I liked it. <laughs> so you see memories of this will get you out of the uh, zombie apocalypse next time. But, yeah, uh, good to good to see Yandamang back uh, in the horror genre, I suppose. Very different. Uh, not as as comedic in this show, but, uh, but you can tell that he has some horror chops in there. And I think that's one of the things that we always took from Dead Set, was that it is actually genuinely a horror and a comedy put together that did a really good job of, of doing both. Um, Charlie Brooker, obviously, also known for Black Mirror, so he's got those chops as well. Uh, but he's not involved in that. The teleplay for this episode is written by the showrunner, Misha Green. She also created the show Underground, which is about the Underground Railway around the time of the Civil War. Uh, also star- starring uh, Journey Smollett, uh, who plays Letitia here in this show. So uh, so obviously the two of them have worked together in the past. Uh, great to see the two of them working together again. It sounds like a really interesting show. I definitely have to check it out. I don't think it yeah, really... it really does actually, yeah. yeah. John, do you want to tell us what Misha Green gave us with your summary for the first episode of Lovecraft Country? Sure. Korean War veteran Ascus Freeman embarks on a journey in search of his missing father, Montrose. After recruiting his uncle George and childhood friend Letitia to join him, the trio sets out for Ardham, Massachusetts, where they think Montrose may have gone. They certainly do end up on a on a journey and one that is filled with horror from start to finish. Uh, both the monster kind and the reality of everyday life in the 1950s, mm-hmm. um, I suppose, uh, as well. But uh, lots of intrigue here in terms of the lady in the silver, uh, I think it's a Bentley, or like at least a big um, sort of uh, car, like a Rolls Royce. Uh, and um, yeah, intrigue there with that, and presumably her brother at the house mm-hmm. right at the end. Maybe, um, or Butler. You know, or Butler, mm-hmm. which says, you know, to uh, Mr. Freeman, as Ascus has rang the bell, a welcome home. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, we've you. been expecting yeah. you. Which So, uh, yeah, lots of intrigue in this. And, mm-hmm. and indeed, the intrigue around um, uh, Ascus's missing father, Montrose, who has gone off to Ardham County in, in Massachusetts. Well, I, I do love the joke in there that, uh, that effectively that's what Ascus thinks because all <laughs> yeah. of the books are based around Arkham or the Arkham Press that publishes all of the books. So he thinks it's Arkham that they're going to, but it's not Arkham at all. It's actually Ardham because he can't read his father's writing, yes. <laughs> which is really good. Uh, but yeah, it's so intriguing. And my first compliment, I suppose, that I'll give the show is it's a, an awful experience for the characters that are going through these, but I, I kind of like how how it's treated as the day to day life of a black American in the fifties. The kind of things that they would be putting up with are unsurprising to them in a way. Um, you know, we we kind of t- hear about uh, what his uncle does for a living, what Uncle George does, that he writes this book, which is the Traveler's Guide to uh, Safe Travel Across America, effectively. Um, so he's done these kind of travels uh, by car across America, yeah. experiencing the situations that they're going to be experiencing on the road. Um, but I kind of almost like that it's not treated as... Um, incident after incident to shock the audience it's treated as these are the genuine experiences that these characters would be kind of almost used to at the time and they know the the tells to get themselves out of those situations as quickly as they can you know Atticus is constantly called the smart guy because he's constantly trying to get himself out of awful situations that he has in there and I love how it's treated on the show I think it's a, a one of the big uh selling points for this show most definitely um we normally 
uh, joined by our friend and fellow podcaster, Chris, yep. um, over on TV Podcast Industries. But we what, did this so quick because we were so excited about the episode. I don't think we even told them that we're recording this. No, we, we? we haven't. <laughs> but if you want to hear us, you can go over to our yeah. Our main feed, TV Podcast Industries, where we've just looked at The Umbrella Academy Season 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have also just looked at uh, Penny Dreadful City of Angels as well on uh, Dreadful Podcast. Yep. And we are about to also look at the start of September at The Boys Season 2 as well. So please head on over and join us for those as well. We'd really like to uh, hear your thoughts on any of those shows uh, as well. But of course, we are jumping in with another little squeezing in a TV show uh, for the next 10 weeks uh, that'll be out every week uh, over on Sky Atlantic and on HBO. And it's it's this one, Lovecraft Country, because we just had to. But John, I think we're going to keep it a little bit looser on having top three or top five points yeah, or exactly. like that. We're just going to talk about the things we liked about the episode. Yeah. So really, what's kind of the first thing that jumps to mind for yourself? So to your point, I, it, it is kind of, you know, we, we've introduced this as a horror show mm-hmm. um, in a sense. Um, it's obviously more than that. And I think that is within the horror itself. Um, so I, I, my main point is um, just the overall umbrella horror of this first episode, you know, from the the racism that is directed towards uh, and experienced by Atticus mm-hmm. George and, and Letitia effectively on their road trip to find uh, his father Montrose um but also then you know set against and with that traditional horror action that we see in the woods you know it's that cabin in the woods yeah. at night um sort of sort of doing the barricades and, and surviving till uh, the daytime yeah. and it, it's just a really really nice blend um you know i don't know who said it i really can't remember where the quote came from or whether i'm just making this up to be honest but i, I do have a feeling that it's from jordan peele mm. um on um the many interviews that he's done that that talked about why there hadn't been more black horror writers directors because the experience of black people in many uh, countries and in different forms uh, and ways of life have experienced horror on a daily basis Mm -hmm. i I suppose that idea like we see here of um effectively being chased out of um a town um where they had stopped simply to get uh, food at, at the diner yeah. and chased out no less by people in the fire brigade and the the the, the police yeah. chasing them down firing at them and um, and as you say the smarts of atticus uh, where him and george have that conversation uh about why were the walls painted white on the white house mm-hmm. and talking about the british um sort of burning of the white house and then them being painted by slaves white to hide the burns. Yeah. Um, and, and that tradition, because all the walls in, in this diner are white and they move one of the, the floor plates to see burnt rafters underneath. And all the while, Letitia is hearing the, the person who's just served them kind of saying, like, I don't want to serve them. What do I do? Well, you know, yeah, he didn't when... even serve them. He just gave them a menu at a exactly. Um, and I think what's even scarier about the scene, if you if you match it up, this is George, who's provided the safe travel guide for black people to travel safely across America. He's going to a place where he's marked in his book. This is somewhere safe to eat. And when they get in there, they find out the place has been burnt out, taken over by people that are exactly. going to kill them. Like that's that in itself is like the premise of a horror movie: going to a place you think you're safe and having other people that are willing to kill you take it over. Exactly, you know? it's the layers of the fact that this probably was a black business mm-hmm. or black owned business at some time that was taken down through arson from it being burnt out, uh, and it then new owners have come in and that's what they're covering up with all of this and um you know effectively run out of town um and this is kind of where we first see um the 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 silver limo that is is mentioned by uh the the owner of a bar back in chicago that um atticus's father has gone to for yeah. to drink that this person came to pick them up with with all this intrigue around why he's going off to uh, Ardham County in Massachusetts. So kind of saves the day. And actually, when you look at that particular moment where that Letitia is driving, she's outrunning the 
the the car behind that's firing on them and, and at the intersection gets in front of this silver uh, limo that that's driving down and goes this limo goes between the two cars but ultimately it swerves and the the, the car that's chasing them down doesn't hit the limo mm-hmm. whether it was i presume there's something supernatural about the driver or even about the car but the the car with the police and the firemen shooting at uh, Atticus, George, and Letitia, it doesn't hit the silver limo. It, it, it just kind of, it's almost like it hits a force field around it and mm-hmm. flips. Yes. Um, uh, but we get this uh, very well-dressed uh, lady stepping out of the car. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yes, and that's kind of it. They kind of drive, 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 you know? So it, yeah. it, it's definitely that moment. Um, but I mean... After kind of a short respite with, I think it's Letitia's brother, you know, they're kind of subjected to even more horror with this, quite frankly, horrific uh, concept of sundown um, and sundown towns yeah. and sundown, in this case, counties. I think it was the Devon County. Mm. And it, it's just kind of really frightening. Like, police fire brigades kind of slogans of protect and serve or you think here in ireland that policing by consent and mm-hmm. um, you know obviously here w- the, there's no the, the police do not carry guns in that sense and yeah. in, in, no in ireland yeah. yeah you know it's only special sort of divisions of uh the police department that would and be trained to handle those weapons mm-hmm. and discharge them under particular circumstances. So having this this notion that even the police are, de- are are sort of almost enforcing, implementing this sundown as well, well or yeah. where if you're not out of a town, and in this case the county by sundown, then effectively you will get lynched or or murdered. Mm-hmm. Um, is quite frankly. The, the the basis of horror stories in itself Absolutely. i mean you you kind of think of the classic horror movies of uh, you know whether it's like wicker man going into towns where people have their own kind of ways that are absolutely abnormal to the rest of society yeah. except this was something that was kind of openly normal even if it was illegal yeah and it it does it kind of brings that idea of things like the wicker man uh to to, to mind yeah. here yeah i have had to look it up because it is something that's kind of alien being from ireland and not living in the us i have lived there before lived in carolina so i'm aware of of how racist some areas of of the us have been and and ha- and still are at, at times but I, the concept of a sundown town was something that i wasn't fully aware of i kind of i have something in the back of my mind about the simple thing of a sign and a town that says get out of here or else uh, bad things will happen to you at night effectively a warning to black people not to go into the town but sundown towns were actually more much more pervasive than that there was there was much more about it the sundown town concept effectively is that they won't allow anybody of any uh, any different race at all settle in the town laws will be made so they can't purchase any uh, any land there or own any business within the town limits and then they extended as you see in this episode just by that line of dialogue they extended to counties um all banding together to say that anybody of any different race couldn't live within the within those bounds so it isn't just the threat of you know you can drive through here during the day but if you're caught here during sundown uh, some bad things will happen to you you know it's much worse than that it is a, it is institutionalized within this this kind of city limits and this town well, like communities um, yeah it, exactly. i mean it, it's real kind of that sense of head of the valleys where yeah. it's a single family just interbreeding for eternity exactly and um, i suppose this, yeah yeah but i suppose the thing that's even scarier is that these places still exist in some uh, some segments of society in in the u.s and some uh, smaller counties some smaller towns these are uh, still practices that are there despite laws being in place across the u.s that nobody can be discriminated against on purchasing a house by their by their color or race or creed effectively so um so these things do still exist these things are still as horrific today as they were back then but just more uh worn on the arm i suppose back in the 50s than they were now you know and uh, i love that moment where we have uh george and, and atticus talking in the in the diner waiting for uh everything that's going on and and george is saying to atticus um you're a veteran you're somebody that people should respect here you don't have to be scared in this town people will respect yeah, you. yeah we're citizens you were, yeah you know, because you were fighting for the freedom of this country they'll respect you and 
Atticus realizes that's not what this town is about. This town is about making sure that anybody of any of any different race than the people in this town will be attacked. Um, and he sees that instantly, you know, like that all three of these characters kind of uh, have their own knowledge about the, the tells, as I said earlier yeah, on, about it, what could happen to them. Yeah, there's real street smart there. But I, mm. I think that that horror of day-to-day life living under that kind of horrific system, mm. you know, and the horror that that presents to try and live to try and live your daily life, um, I thought was really, really well done here and i think you know set against that traditional horror then right at the end yeah. um where you know they're being taken into the woods to effectively uh, to be shot and, and then you hear the, the the chirping and cheering of this unknown monster and you get this whole like traditional horror uh kind of action really where uh they, they are being picked off in the woods the the sheriffs that are with this kind of head of the police from devon county mm-hmm. um who's a real nasty piece of work um oh, like proper yeah, proper just obnoxious and like that, and that, horrible like his his one line that really just struck fear into my heart was where Addox has asks him about taking a U-turn. He stops and says, yeah, yeah. you know, can I take a U-turn here or is that against the law? And he goes, oh, well, I'm glad you asked me. Now that you said it, I'll, I'll make an exception. But if you stay here after sundown, it would be my duty to string you up and lynch you effectively. Like, this, this well, is a horrific person yeah. who gets everything that's coming to him. There's such great wish fulfillment as you watch this episode. There's moments in this episode where you just want to punch the people on the screen for the lines they're saying and that moment where you see what happens to him above all of the rest of the officers all taken out and all killed but the gruesomeness of what happens to him is it's it's such great hero fulfillment well well, well, that's it and i mean the the traditional horror element here is that idea of being picked off in you know in the woods Mm -hmm. you know it almost feels very much predator-esque in in, in that sense getting some um some attack the block vibes as well exactly you you have them going to the cabin in the woods to kind of hunker down Mm -hmm. uh to kind of try and survive till the daytime and again even just that element of traditional horror you have george sort of recounting a verse from bram stoker's dracula about the children of the night oh, yes. singing uh, as these creatures are kind of communicating to one another and yeah. um, vibes right what happened you know you, you see that this this the head of the police has been bitten uh, but has survived and um, as i think the, the three of his men have been taken out and he, you know you get this coughing as he starts to transform and you, and you kind of have uh, i love george's comment here with with the other sheriff there he goes uh, you need to shoot him now um <laughs> because it's what happens if you get bitten by a vampire and you don't die yeah. you transform and you get this transformation of this this obnoxious chief of police into for devon county monster. into this mon an actual monster <laughs> yeah. you know sort of that realization of almost who he actually is mm-hmm. Now he he does escape, and I'm just wondering what will happen there. Whether we'll see him again in that form, because one of the interesting things about it is that Letitia, I like this. She can run. I she's told to go and get the car because what they've realised is that like uh, vampires, the the torchlight that they have and um, seems to fend them off. Okay. Um, and she <laughs> is told. Well, it's Askers who is going to go, but then again, this um, chief of police uh, says, no, the girl, you'll get smart and you'll try and escape. I love that scene of her running. Like, she does it so well because she's running so hard, you can really feel it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, she's kind of like whimpering and screaming because it's just like, this is so frightening to be in this position. Mm-hmm. Um, Fear won't help us, John. And it, it's just so nicely done. And I, I think that uh, ultimately she s- saves Ascus and George from the chief, of, the, the transformed chief of police. And, you know, they, they chuck out the flares. But one of the interesting things, and it's kind of why I think, will we see him again? It, is just because there's kind of a, a high pitched whistle that goes through the mm. forest. They almost, it's almost like a dog whistle calling off, um, the, the, the pack. Absolutely. And that's really interesting because I think, you know, is it to do with the lady in the silver sedan? Is it to do with these people that we're, we don't know about yet? Um, and, and their part in this story. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a really nice, 
sort of intrigue here. And yeah. I, and I think that the mix of horror in this episode is just really so, so well done. Definitely. Because Letitia and, and Atticus were under attack from these creatures. I think they're shogats, shogats, uh, depending on your pronunciation. Um, Atticus mentions these creatures as protectors or as uh, minions, I suppose, of Cthulhu uh, from uh, H.P. Lovecraft stories. He mentions them a few times earlier on. Um, he doesn't specifically call out that that's what they are, I think, Um when they come on screen, because they're obviously they're running in the screening, uh, they don't get a moment to stop and say the name of of the creatures. But I was wondering, you know, there, there's that moment where you're wondering whether they are the protectors of Atticus George and Letitia, and that's why they're called off. Maybe is that what it is? But they were definitely under attack at, at moments within this uh, this scene in the in the woods, weren't they? So there's no. Well, it is, and if if they are protectors, it might explain why why George is. It survives coming through and even though he, he he you know he's rationalizing that it's the torch because mm. that's all he got through to the cabin yeah. with yeah uh, you know we see Letitia turn on the headlights of the car which seems to um frighten away one of these creatures to, to, the to burrow down into the ground yeah, cool. but but maybe you know and she, she is attacked again and she uses the flashlight so there, there is that. So, but, but it could also be a protector. Uh, but maybe they're just not quite as disciplined protectors mm -hmm. as, say, a very well trained dog, yeah. for example. Um, it, it could be that they, they still need that sort of dog whistle control mm -hmm. to, to be able to sort of stop them from attacking the people they're supposed to protecting. But nonetheless, I thought this was really so well done mm -hmm. uh, in this episode. Uh, it felt so rich uh, with everything uh, within the horror genre. Uh, the other thing I, to draw from this for me was, uh, and it's the opening quote from the the first episode, is mm -hmm. that chat uh, between Atticus and the lady who was traveling with him yeah. um, was just really, really good. I, I was, think it? um, it's, you know, it's that chat about the book that Ascus is reading on the um, on the coach back to Chicago uh, to find out, you know, maybe more about where his his missing father Montrose is. Mm -hmm. And uh, it it was just, I think it's played really really nicely. the The book is Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs, mm -hmm. um, and within that is actually the the, the first um, reference to John Carter of Mars and. Uh, I am a huge fan of John Carter of Mars and I'm a big <laughs> fan of the movie. Yeah. Um, however awful people may have thought that was. I think um, it just came out as a bad time. They always say that I John think Carter it inspired so many other yeah. things and they got the credit. But John Carter was around in like the 1900s and yeah. earlier. But, like but it's it's just um, so good. Yeah. And it, it was just interesting, you know. Um, Asuka starts to, to explain to, to her as effectively they've been abandoned on the side of the road because the coach has broken down and the, the person who's got the truck who's come to sort of give them the lift into town to the next stop to pick up the next coach mm. won't allow blacks onto his, um, truck. So uh, like, you know, the, just from that opening yeah. setup moment, you know, that the, you, you see it with, uh, Atticus leaving town and just sticking up a finger to another bridge named after a slave owner, yeah, as, exactly. as the fellow traveller describes it. But the two of them again, you know, you see him looking at this at this uh, driver going, "Well, he's not going to get let, let black people on board. We're we're only just relegated to the last four seats on a bus. This guy's not yeah. going to allow us to sit in the back of his of his truck." And he just walks over and says to uh, his fellow traveller, "I'll carry your bags for you." And both of them seem completely used to this. It feels like this is something that they definitely wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be protesting in a way. They wouldn't be protesting about because they're so used to this kind of crap happening uh, at the time. I suppose it's, it's another indication of how you're go how we're going with the show. I suppose. Yeah, yeah I, I think so. I mean, but I I loved how Ascus is explaining uh, to to her as they're walking down the the the, the country road. You know, it was a a. a captain in the confederate army from virginia he was chased by apaches uh, into one of their ceremonial caves where then he, you know he's transported to the red planet i always remember being transfixed reading um the these pulp fiction effectively um with that way of doing it first of all i was really intrigued by 
the um, Indigenous Americans and, and First Peoples. I thought that was just... I've always been interested um, about their their culture mm -hmm. in, in America and and Canada. The idea then that that was kind of the that almost spiritual connection that they have to another planet uh, and and the forces that were on that red planet on Mars. Um, and you, you know she she's kind of like so. Hang on, he he fought for slavery, and and Ascus is well, he's an ex Confederate yeah. captain. And she goes, X doesn't change. Uh, change anything here it doesn't change that um, and then Ascus has a I, I just think it's a really nice point of you know stories are like people loving them doesn't make them perfect you just try and cherish them and overlook their flaws and she goes their flaws are still there and he's kind of yeah, yes they are but I love pulp stories which mm -hmm. is kind of what this is about and I think um, I think one of the interesting things from this is that H.P. Lovecraft, other authors have dubious backgrounds as to where their ideological or, or moral or ethical <laughs> core is. Um, and H.P. Lovecraft is a straight up racist. Like, yeah, well, no, exactly. Yeah, and I, I, I love, I, I love the idea that you can take bits of what he put into the world and go, these are great bits. It doesn't yeah. have to just define everything in a way. I well, and I, I think it's the kind of, it's almost the philosophy of Ascus, which is that, um, these heroes that he's reading about in a book written by a white guy are not perfect, probably don't necessarily speak exactly to who he is, mm -hmm. but that he puts himself in that adventure, exactly. in their place. So he becomes John Carter. Mm -hmm. And so by becoming John Carter, he is no longer as such an ex-Confederate soldier exactly. um, who fought for slavery. Yeah. He's a black guy saving the princess uh, of Mars. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, to that point, that opening sequence is just, I mean, I, my, my sci-fi fantasy um, horror sort of love just kind of slightly melted there. Yeah. And um, uh, with everything going on there. Yeah, absolutely. Talk about that, about that in just a second as well. Um, because it is, I suppose, this moment, I just want to highlight it as well, just just as you have. This is one of the things that I feel is so important as a, as a statement of this show, you know. So many times over the decades and centuries, books have not had the representation that anybody from any minority has wanted them to have. You know, we don't see our faces reflected in the stories that are being consumed by the mass media by mass market. And sometimes you'll see a lot of minorities shoved into one story because somebody's finally been given a platform to put those minorities in a story. What Atticus is saying here is just like, just like we did when we were reading all of these books and comic books that didn't directly represent us, we stuck our faces on those heroes. We stuck our, our concepts into their heads so that we could read them from our own perspective and every individual person reading a novel and reading a book or even watching a movie or even watching a TV show puts their own perspective on those characters. And I love how well encapsulated it is here. And I suppose what I do like even more is, and I suppose one of the things I should definitely call out here is a lot of these scenes are taken directly from the book, directly from Matt Ruff's novel Lovecraft Country. There's a, this this conversation here is actually almost word for word a conversation that Atticus has with his father in the in the book. Um, so this is something that has is out there and is being translated onto the onto the TV show. I think some people have have thought that this is um, respecting the work of H.P. Lovecraft, and that's why it's called Lovecraft Country. Uh, Matt Ruff was writing his book from exactly the perspective as the TV show is is taking uh, is taking its cue. Um, so there is a lot of similarities there with what was actually going on in the book. So I, I've actually heard since the show came out, I've heard people going, well, I'm not going to watch that because I don't respect H.P. Lovecraft's opinions and his beliefs. Well, the show is telling you right up front, we don't respect them either. That guy was a racist, but there were concepts in there that we should all take as individuals and run with them as great horror concepts because yeah. we can tell the new stories using some of the building blocks that are in there from this evil racist guy. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, which I, th I think is a really interesting concept, especially in the time of cancel culture, as we've seen, you say one word and uh, there's a lot of cancellation, get out, get out of the industry you're in. Uh, I like the idea of taking, getting rid of the person and taking some of the great concepts they've come up with. I think that's a, a really interesting way of looking at it.
Yeah, definitely, mm-hmm. definitely. Now, you had a lot of points there, and a lot of them were my points as well, so we're not going to go on a huge amount more about the episode, because I think we've talked a lot about the episode itself, because there's some some great stuff going on in here. But for me, one of the things that really stood out, apart from you know all of the stuff we discussed about racism and the real horror in the world, and the fictional horror there as well, uh, really combining very well in the show, um, some of the things I, I loved about it was that it did feel so different. Some choices were made in how this was filmed that felt like something you wouldn't see on any other TV show. The actual opening of the episode where we have a, effectively a horror dream sequence, a nightmare sequence from uh, Atticus while he's asleep on the bus and it filling up with all of these sci-fi creatures and characters uh, in his almost part of, partially combining with his memories of the Korean War, a, a Korean War veteran, where he's walking through getting shot at yeah um he's having the voiceover of somebody going this is an american boy living the american dream of fighting for his country basically which is effectively what Atticus thought he was doing by going and joining the army so that's part of the nightmare and then it just builds into you see the tripods from war of the worlds on one side yep. of the battlefield you see um Cthulhu himself flying or him or herself flying over the head over the head of everybody and you see the UFOs above carrying the it's princess of Mars like this is a massive massive opening for this show with you know? so many different references mm-hmm. uh, as well like um you know we, we've talked a lot about the the literary side I mean, we've already talked about Bram Stoker H.P. Yeah. Lovecraft Edgar Rice Burroughs there was Alexandra Dumas as well in here uh, but you know in this as well it seems like there's H.G. Wells from War of the Worlds as you say there's yeah. the UFOs and um, there's there's so much going on here and it was just a treat for the eyes yeah absolutely i think uh, i think behind uh, Atticus when he's seeing um Cthulhu for the first time I think you see a battle going on between the warriors of Mars and his army mates or his ar- or the army behind him basically so a, 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 another incorporation of the stuff that's going on in his mind and then again I also love you know that they incorporate a real life hero in here um where we have Jackie Robinson um the baseball player who takes out uh, Cthulhu I think that's cool because he kind of have you know he's with he's, his baseball bat as exactly. well because yeah, it also exactly. feels like a bit of a dream or nightmare that you've had in your life where it's not it's not completely logical to have your hero of the sports field <laughs> battling your hero of a or your villain of your uh, pulp piece or your comic books that you read but I love that this is something that is happening in his head because it, it feels totally right, you know, for for that inside a dream, you know. Um, Jackie Robinson was the first player to break the color, baseball color line. Uh, he, he was the first black player to play for uh, any major league baseball team when he played for the Brooklyn Dodgers uh, back in 47. So he would be a real life hero of yeah, this guy in 1954. It's seven years, seven years later, you know. So really enjoyed just those little touches that were in there, you know. And also along the drive, you know, rather than the entire show being soundtrack to music of the era, I loved the idea of having this, the James Baldwin speech Absolutely. being played on the radio. This is a, a speech genuinely, I probably only heard it this year because it was something that was going around on Facebook uh, quite recently. Um, some, a speech that I just hadn't heard before. It's the same speech that's being used in, in the show. It's such an inspiring and, and, and wonderful speech to have, um, have played on the radio as they're going through these cities, just talking about the, idea of being a black person in america in Absolutely. these times it's it's so so relevant and so interesting that they chose that as the soundtrack it feels like you know it feels like something new it feels like something that nobody else would i think after watching the episode of just a, an insight of how good i thought this was after watching the episode i said to john why did we put up with 20 years of knowing all of the tropes of horror movies to the point that horror movies became now we do a horror movie that's a parody and now we do a comedy parody of the comedy parody horror movie that we've just seen because yeah, we all know absolutely who dies first it's always the black character we always know who lives it's the virginia white girl we always know who dies it's the stoner guy we all knew these were the tropes of movies and the reason why there were tropes is because nobody else was given a voice to tell something yeah new no, yeah exactly where it, this feels like a voice telling something new in the visual medium of TV and HBO have been so good at that over the last couple of years. Well, it's really interesting with the James Baldwin um, 
sort of talk mm-hmm. that he gave uh, on the on the radio. Because for me, I came to that from a, a very um, sort of circumvented way. Because as well, I I read his his book um, Giovanni's Room, which mm-hmm. is about uh, uh, an American in Paris uh, um, who falls in love. Uh, with an Italian waiter at a Parisian gay bar. Mm-hmm. So I, I remember reading that uh, as, as a, as a teenager, uh, James Baldwin. Um, and then that sort of, when I went down the rabbit hole, as you do as a teenager, where you obsess about something, I, I kind of went down the rabbit hole of James Baldwin mm-hmm. and suddenly realized all these other uh, novels and, and books that he had done, but also this, this very, very well known, uh, radio, uh, or speech in general, yeah. uh, that he gave talking about how, uh, I suppose, the place, the feelings of people who are suppressed and in particular mm-hmm. black people in America. But he, he you know, he, he, even in the speech in the car, it's referencing about why French are in Algeria and, and Brits in India. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that so important and, and i think for for me it was just it, it's this combination that you know he he very much spoke to me uh, as someone uh in, as a teenager discussing my own sexuality within my head so th- this was just really phenomenally good yeah. uh yeah. for me and uh like top marks for them picking james Baldwin because i never thought i would be on a podcast now mm-hmm. speaking about that speech that um we heard on the radio in there what after i i just by chance re- came across james baldwin as a teenager mm-hmm. and realized that he had r- written uh gay fiction yeah, um yeah. and wanted to explore that world and then realized this whole other world of that james baldwin had been involved in uh, as well so like it, it's really just really interesting how how things happen mm-hmm. uh, i suppose yeah. but they're uh, like great kind of as you say uh idea yeah you know yeah absolutely yeah yeah and that's really interesting i have to uh have to read that novel john i have to give them give me that I haven't haven't given me that one yet well it, the bookshelf's just that's behind right, us right so behind. Uh, <laughs> that's yeah. right behind. fire there's, away <laughs> there's a few books on there that i haven't haven't read just yet um but overall i think i think this is a great setup to a season. I think this this show is off to such a good start. It's fascinating in how well it's dealing with the mechanics of racism in uh, in 1950s America. It's fascinating how it's dealing with the horror of the situations these characters are in, both through man and through sp- supernatural that are in there. I'm I'm really really loving it. Everything down to the name of the episode being Sundown and as you're watching the episode and as we talked about the horrific thing that we learned from the episode is Sundown towns exist and what they are well actually it's what's even more interesting is they flip that on its head Sundown is when the true monsters actually come out or the supernatural monsters come out and all you've got to do is survive now until sunrise so yeah. uh, so what was put on the plate for the characters of Atticus George and Letitia was you will only survive if you get out of this town by sundown and now they're still in an, in the rough area by sundown and all they can do to survive is stay alive till sunrise so a uh, lovely little uh, little play there lovely. yeah definitely yeah. definitely john overall anything else you want to say about the episode no, I think that's all from me. I think uh, I've managed to squeeze everything that I possibly can from Excellent. that, for sure. Um, yeah. Yourself? Nothing else for me. I think, again, yep, I think we've talked about as much as you possibly can between the two of us for this one. Uh, overall, what do you think of the episode, John? Um, I, I loved this uh, episode one. I'm, I would give it five shuggaths out of five. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just... It really captured uh, my imagination yeah. um, and my, I suppose, own sense of inquiry, both, I suppose, from a just a, a human point of view, but also with with uh, loving the horror. Um, I, I think there's so much intrigue here. Guy coming back from the Korean War, going back to Chicago to try and understand where his dad has gone, going on this road trip and um, that takes him through the horrors of um America for black people um and faced as you say with the horrors of the supernatural yeah. uh, in the cabin in the woods and and that kind of deep irony of having to survive moving 
uh, across a, 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 an imaginary boundary to survive uh, sundown uh, from from white people to then having to to survive till sun up or, or sunrise uh, to survive the supernatural uh, in the cabin in the woods yeah. um, w- is just it w- was so good. Um, I love all the references going on in this from the books, from the James Baldwin speech. I think. You know, the characters here are just, you know, Letitia is fierce as anything. Uh, I really, really like her. Uh, she she knows her own mind. Mm-hmm. I love George. I love his kind of cool, calm, philosophical nature. And, you know, for me, the standout uh, is certainly uh, when he's, he says, you need to shoot him now. Um, <laughs> like, great, it yeah. is just really nice sort of deadpan play. I also At- love the T-shirt, get the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she, exactly. She runs out of the town yeah. and I'm driving immediately after. And, and Atticus, I just mm. think, this is a character that attached to here. I really want to see um, how Atticus Freeman, um, you know, I love how he, he is, is the smarts. I like how, he knows how to 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 survive yeah. and to be himself, and I I want to see how Ascus Freeman is now embroiled with this um, fairly Aryan looking uh, lady mm-hmm. and um, butler slash gentleman mm-hmm. um, in this huge house in the middle of Arden County, Massachusetts, Absolutely. and what that means for the Freeman family his uncle uh, his childhood friend and and his father who we, we we've still not seen so like so much intrigue really interesting uh fabulous television um so yeah definitely absolutely and admit it you also want to see alex Vader's shirt again oh well maybe there could be a little <laughs> bit of that as well absolutely um yeah i have to i have to say i love that scene with letitia when she's, <laughs> yeah, when she's watching on she... just takes the camera out to take a couple of snaps <laughs> exactly you and me girl hilarious, uh, hilarious. absolutely um Yes, an excellent episode. Uh, I've got nothing more to say uh, about it, but uh, cannot wait to get back to the next episode of Lovecraft Country, Season 1, Episode 2, Whitey's on the Moon, next week. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, fellow Dreadfuls, if you have any feedback you want to give, any thoughts, discussion points, theories on on the book by Matt Ruff or on the series, uh, the characters, please send in your thoughts to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. You can head on over to our website as well, to tvpodcastindustries.com, and you can leave uh, an audio feedback. Mm-hmm. 90 seconds of your thoughts. Please just click on the right-hand tab uh, and leave your thoughts there, and we'll play those back in the feedback section of the podcast. Yep. And, of course, we are there on all different forms of social media. You can head on over to our Facebook group at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash TV podcast industries or over on Twitter to TV pod industries Mm -hmm. uh, and join us there. We really hoped you loved this episode of Lovecraft Country as much as we did. Mm -hmm. And as Derek said, yes, we will be back uh, next week with episode two, Whitey's on the Moon. Yeah, we were so quick in recording this episode and uh, so excited about recording this episode. We didn't tell anybody that we were recording it, even our loyal listeners over on TV Podcast Industries. Thanks so much for finding us. We'll talk to you next time. Bye. Yeah, thank you so much, fellow Dreadfuls, for joining us. It's, as always, a pleasure discussing this fantastic different types of TV with you. Remember, keep watching, keep listening, and importantly on the Dreadful Podcast, keep screaming. Screaming. Bye.